our conversation will be caught. Welcome to our 15th episode of Apex Instant Tips, coming to you live every Friday at 12.05 EST for five minutes only from Massachusetts. My name is Hayden. And I'm Anton. And Hayden, it turns out that last week's Wisdom of the Week foreshadowed this week's tip. In last week's Wisdom of the Week, you suggested that um, folks might want to try to inject some humanity into their applications. And I mentioned that I'd spent uh, decades trying to extract personality. Um, you, you might even know that uh, when I was at Oracle for quite a while, I ran a character mode Pine email server so that I could avoid the GUI <laughs> inter-office application. Um, so I, I, um, I am a tough critic when it comes to this kind of thing. And not only be, a big piece of it is that these things tend to see, seem to me to require a lot of developer interaction, not just in the development of the animations, but everywhere you want to use them. They, they, and every time you use them, it's the opportunity to inject a bug, and that bug is is then not caught till later on. So it's just not budget friendly, and, and that's a big part of my my angst when it comes to these things. Um, that said, you have a huge challenge in front of you uh, to complete this within five minutes. Yes, absolutely. You are my audience this week, Anton, more so than anybody else, because I want to persuade you to uh, give this a chance. So uh, for uh, this week's tip, I decided to take inspiration from Vincent Morneau's blog, in which he advertises the possibility of adding rich animations, specifically so-called lotty animations, to your Apex application. I well, encourage you. Go, go, go ahead, but I, I'm, I'm going to have you kick off the timer because yeah. I don't want to give you any advantages because this is, I know, has been a huge amount of work already. Um, yeah. So, Okay, so I, I will, um, why don't I start with a demo? So so let, let's show the finished product before we get into anything. So here I have a, um, uh, a page that submits a lengthy database process. When I submit it, um, I, I get this overlay animation. It's a Lottie file. It shows it at random. I kind of like it. Uh, it submits the, the, this lengthy database process. Upon success, it then has a success animation, which is a rocket. I, uh, I like these. This is cute. Uh, I could see this. I, in the, uh, some application might want this. If I submit a uh, an invalid thing. Uh, no, no fear. The um, uh, the animation detects the presence of the uh, validation error and doesn't run. Uh, next stop and final stop in my demo. Uh, I have a no data found animation. So it, it sort of just spruce up the negative experience of not finding your data. So how did I achieve this magic? And the good news is that it involves very little developer lift. So uh, well, you you say it, it, I, I know there was developer lift. I saw well, it in action this week. <laughs> <laughs> no developer lift for anyone who wants to follow these instructions. So I'll put it that way. Okay. All so right. uh, my first stop is uh, in my user interface. Uh, in my JavaScript section, I have uh, references to two files. One is the Lottie um, JavaScript file, obviously. Mm -hmm. And second is this mystery file that I personally created called uh, loading.js. Let's take a look at what that is. So I'm going to go to my um, shared uh, application files. And if I take a look at loading.js, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Essentially, I copied and pasted a bunch of JavaScript from Vincent's blog, wrapped it in, in a series of function calls to create the various waiting success and no data found animations. And then on page load, I load the uh, uh, waiting animation. Um, I load the create no data found animation for any instance of an interactive report. And then I have this hook that, that interrupts the waiting animation in the event of there being a validation error. Uh, so uh, next stop, let's go to page zero. So on page zero, globally accessible to the application, I have two regions. First, a, uh, a waiting animation region in which I have a bunch of custom attributes. And I should have specified this. I will post these details to a blog. Uh, so don't bother taking notes as you follow along. Um, <laughs> And then a success animation region, which uh, also has some customer attributes, but even more importantly, has uh, a, a PLSQL expression uh, server-side condition that uh, only displays it in the event of their detecting a success message on the page. 
Okay. Yeah. So Hayden, oh, in, in more? Uh, a little bit more. <laughs> uh, also on page zero, two dynamic actions. Uh, first dynamic action is a, a dynamic action that, that loads the success animation. Again, with the sa that same condition of their being, of their detecting the success message on that page. And then uh, finally, uh, a, a dynamic action that detects for the existence of an interactive report. And then uh, upon refresh of that uh, special class, it then loads the create new data found animation. So as I as I jumped in earlier, I I, I think clearly there's a lot of work here, and, and as a tip goes, the the tip needs the companion blog. But what I really am struck by, at least so far, is that everything you've done is in page zero or in JavaScript file. So there's, it looks like this is going to apply across the entire application without any developer subsequent development involvement once you've done this. Is am I getting that right? Yes, with with some small caveats. So on uh, on this report page, that is 100% true. So uh, whether I add more interactive reports to this page or elsewhere in the application, this will by default be endowed with this particular animation in the event of a new data found. I, I like that anyway, just because uh, it sounds to me like you could do things like um, change your no data found across the whole application easily. So 100%. Uh, on the um, on this page, there are, are are two very small conditions that that a developer will need to pay attention to if they want to leverage this. Uh, so they uh, they will need to um, submit their page via dynamic action, so declaratively, and then add a small amount of JavaScript, or they can do it declaratively. They can show the waiting animation. I chose to do it with JavaScript because I wanted to put a delay on it. I didn't want it to display by default in every instance of um, submitting the page. I only wanted to do it if it was, if it was in fact a long database process. And then uh, lastly, um, uh, you will need to specify uh, a success message in order to get the uh, success message animation. So <laughs> that, that, well, that last part, everybody should do everyone. Anyway, the, the success message should be there. So I will give you the extra three seconds on that. Um, so you've <clears throat> managed to, demonstrate and you know give the basic guidance for uh, interacting with three animations within your application and essentially limiting any kind of developer involvement post in implementation. Um, and, and I'll change just a little bit more. Um, I, I did want to uh, really encourage people to check out Laudia files um, at links to and Vince's blog. Um, I, I think you'll find inspiration here for how you might uh, add personality humor, that little bit spark of joy to your application. So, uh, but I'm cheating. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> so I, I do think that we um, managed to hit the five minute and two second mark. So we're going to call it a win. Um, Joel may come back and have a little bit of uh, a grief <laughs> with, with that, but I think two or three seconds over is is uh, within, within the right realm. Uh, and uh, so for anybody that came in for just the five minutes, please do all the things you're supposed to do, like, subscribe, send a letter to your friends, smash the bell, all the things the kids do today. Uh, but Hayden, let's stick around for a few minutes. We'll do a wisdom of the week. We'll answer any questions that people have. We'll, um, oh, and I've got an answer to last week's puzzler. Uh, yeah. So um, that said, before we jump right into that, uh, you were, talking about the Lottie animations and so forth. Uh, so my take on this is that you have successfully convinced me that because you have already done the work, I might implement this. I can say that I know how much work this was. Um, and so I, I would not have attempted it myself. Um, but now the work is done. So, so I don't take those words lightly, Anton. Uh, and so I will follow up with you. Um, I, I, I want to know if you ever get around to put in this into action. I, I, I know that you run several uh, applications that where the UX is important. Uh, you have your COVID-19 website and you, you also run a, um, a code review website where UX matters. Maybe those might be places where you could inject this. Well, if if I do, we will spend a moment on this show to, to show it happen. Um, 
because I do like uh, I, I do like particularly the, the pure code review. I think there's some opportunity for this. So let's move into uh, this week's wisdom of the week. And if people have questions, certainly uh, ask them. Uh, this week's wisdom of the week is really that um, bad code is exists. I'm not convinced that good code does exist, or at least that there's not a definition for good code that is obvious. Um, there's a great co comic by XKCD um, that uh, I'll let folks just take a quick look at while I speak. Uh, but the, the point is this, good code is timely code. Um, they're, they're, in most cases, if you don't get the code done in the, in the time that it's needed by, it's not good code. The COVID-19 things that you mentioned, Hayden, we spun up a site in a week, a long, very long weekend uh, related to that. And had we waited much longer, it may not have had the, any real value. So it's a huge challenge to write good code in a timely manner. And I think that defining what good code is includes getting it done on time. And that may mean that it, that it doesn't have every perfect aspect to it. I've had the opportunity to have Stephen Feuerstein uh, reviewing some of my code recently. And I look at it and I know that Stephen's going to find tons of things wrong with it. Um, but at the time that I wrote it and when it went in, I'm still satisfied that I went in with code that was satisfactory. Now that I have the time to review it and make improvements, I'm going to do exactly that. So, yeah. It, it's a, uh, I like it. it, it um, it'll help me have more empathy uh, for myself when I look back at my old code. Yes, and I think that's an important thing to, to recognize. Um, the question is, can you share your demo app's source? Yes, so I will publish a blog in which I cover all of the details uh, because I, I know I, I glossed over some pretty key uh, uh, details. So all of it will be pushed in a blog uh, either later today or early next week. Oh, yeah, because as you as I just said, um, timeliness is important on this one, right? The blog doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be there. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I, there there will always be room to improve the blog. <laughs> I think that's uh, I think that's uh, it applies immediately to this case. You know what occurs to me? Uh, I, I think one question is like, why do we do these tips live? And I think part of the virtue of the live tips is to remove the temptation to later edit it because it's not going to be perfect. And if we, if, if these were artifacts that we could then like work and rework and stuff like that, it, it would just be exhausting. <laughs> I like this and code as if Steven is doing your code review. Yeah, that is absolutely, well, that's, that's the reason to have code reviews in general is because when you know that somebody else is reviewing it, Steven, or really even me, um, you know, you, you, you definitely code with a different, uh, a little bit of different, perspective. Um, 100%. Um, so uh, that said, um, last week's puzzler, let me pull up the whiteboard of truth. As we all know, here at Apex Instant Tips, we don't have much of a budget. Uh, so we oh. get to... And, and just so we're clear, Anton, uh, Mark has a prepared answer for you. Oh, oh does he? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so set up the, the tip, but then, but then Mark is going to deliver that. Yeah, excellent. So the tip was this. Um, if you have the, the three, if you have three dots, for example, can you can you rearrange them and connect them so that they all talk, they all are connected to one another? That's quite easy to do. Uh, but then the question is, can you do four? And if you can do four, can you do five? And so that's right. I had forgotten that Mark was our first. Uh, correct answer. Mark is part of the in some universe, in some cinematic universe, um, and in fact, a key part because he produces a lot of these shows. Mark, why don't you jump on and give us the solution? Welcome, Mark. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's, it's it's an honor. Um, okay, so um, I'm just in order to uh, show you the solution. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, don't worry. It's I only have. Uh, uh, it, well, I, I cut it down to 45 slides, so it should be pretty short compared to what I what I used to have. So, um, as Anton said, we have uh, we basically have four dots to work with, and uh, because he told us, you know, that well, or he showed us that you can easily uh, resolve the puzzle with three dots using a triangle. Well, the first thing that came to my mind, and probably everyone, is that if I have four dots, well, I would do some sort of square thing. 
uh, and then I started connecting the dots, but I realized pretty rapidly that that's not going to work because you will always have one straight line to connect all the dots that will intersect. So I went back to uh, what the problem was, uh, the answer that Anton had given us, and the extra dot. But no matter where I put the extra dot outside the triangle, uh, I couldn't make all the dots connect without uh, having intersecting lines. So I just had this flash that if I put the dot inside the triangle, uh, then I could connect all the lines and not have any intersecting ones. So, so you uh, did that pretty quickly. How long is it going to take you to do five dots? Um, I've, I've worked on five dots uh, on and off for the past uh, week. Uh, I would say I've given 47 hours so far on it, but I, I still haven't found the answer. But no, uh, I, honestly, though, uh, if the, I think for me, the real takeaway to this is, uh, you know, if you look at how it's done, um, I would say search for the solution within. That's I think that's that's the takeaway. But but I think even more importantly, um, in some means to be in. Right. So you're in the solution and that's how we like to work. We like to work with our customers in the solution and not be separate from our customers when we create solutions. So uh, was, it, was that too commercial or <laughs> Mark, Mark, you have said the standard for what we should what we should strive for with these puzzlers. Like, Absolutely. Like, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I have more budget than Anton. So obviously Clearly, you I, have I work in marketing. Budget. So you, you have a slide budget. I don't even have a slide budget. Well, yeah, how did no, that happen? Well, so. <laughs> So, so that's. Uh, that's no, I, I love that. That was great. And so, so there is no solution for the five dots. There, there is. You, you cannot do five dots without, uh, you know. What? Some, uh... <laughs> Sorry okay. about that, Mark. A little, a little time waster there. Um, so, uh, well, thanks for joining us, Mark. And thanks for both of you uh, of, uh, in our audience for joining us, as uh, the two of you do every week. Uh, but um, we encourage you to join us next week. We'll have more of the same, perhaps a new puzzler. Um, any final words, Hayden? Uh, no, um, I look forward to seeing everyone next Friday. All right, it's the smash the bell. Um, everybody, subscribe. Write letters. Write letters, yeah, <laughs> all that stuff. All right.